The equity market has been among the bright spots in the economy during the pandemic, adding to the wealth of locks of investors as well as resulting in higher revenue collections on equity transaction. Average daily turnover in the cash segment of the NSE has more than doubled since 2019-20 while the volumes in the equity derivative segment has recorded a much higher growth. This intense equity market activity is a result of a large number of retail investors doing intraday trading in stocks and stock derivatives, using the spare time available during the COVID-induced lockdown. This is reflected in the surge in new demat and trading accounts opened in the last two years as well as the lower share of delivery in cash trading when compared with pre-pandemic period. This excessive speculation is not conducive for healthy growth of capital market. The finance minister Nirmala Sitarman can play a part in nudging small investors away from short-term speculative trades in the upcoming union budget. One way of doing this is by reviewing the long-term capital gains tax on equity mutual funds with a view to pushing investors to the mutual funds route. Direct equity investing is quite risky for small investors, and they need to be encouraged to invest in stocks through mutual funds. It is also important that they invest for the long term and not churn their holding needlessly. The existing scheme of taxing gains exceeding 1 Indian rupee lakh made in equity mutual funds held for more than one year at 10% can be replaced with zero capital gains tax on gains made in equity mutual funds held for more than three years. This can be a temporary exemption that can be in place for the next five years so that the sudden spurt in speculation among retail investors can be tempered and the center does not lose too much revenue in the bargain. It should be pointed out here that the move to bring back tax on LTCG on equity and equity funds in 2018 was rather unfair because securities transaction tax was introduced in 2004 in lieu of LTCG on equity and equity mutual funds ostensibly to promote long-term investing. Bringing back LTCG on equity-related instruments in 2018 while retaining STT amounts to excessive taxation on equity investment. Indian equity instruments are subject to much higher tax incidents when compared to many other countries. Some relief in taxation will not only create sustained demand for Indian shares, but it can also help convert some of the newbie traders into long-term investors. In view of decline in the number of COVID cases in the national capital, the Delhi Disaster Management Authority on Friday directed that outside the containment zone, all private offices can function with up to 50% of attendance. It advised private offices to stagger the office timing and also the presence and quantum of staff to reduce the number of employees attending the office at the same time. However, it also advised to continue with the practice of work from home. Meanwhile, Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal had also proposed to curtail weekend curfew to the Lieutenant Governor Anil Baijal but the latter rejected the recommendation. While the Karnataka government lifted the weekend curfew from Friday in view of low hospital admissions due to COVID-19, Tamil Nadu announced a complete lockdown all over the state on January 23. On Friday, India reported 347, 254 cases and 703 deaths in the last 24 hours till 8 a.m., as per the health ministry data. The daily positivity rate was at 17.94% and the weekly positivity rate was at 16.56%. In Delhi, the cases were at 10,756 on Friday with 38 deaths and the positivity rate stood at 5.16%. Further, on the reports of leakage of data of several Indians from the government server, R.S. Sharma who is in charge of Cowan platform said, our attention has been drawn to the news claiming the data meant for Cowan portal leaked online. While we will inquire into the substance of the news, prima facie the assertion is not correct. The reason is that Cowan collects neither the address of the person nor the RT-PCR test results for vaccination. Further, we would like to assert that no data has leaked from the Cowan portal and the entire data of residents is safe and secure on our platform. Also, the ministry informed Friday that with the revised rules, six members can register using one mobile number on Cowan. Till now, only four members could do so. A new utility feature has been introduced under Raise an issue in Cowan account through which the beneficiary can revoke its current vaccination status from fully vaccinated to partially vaccinated status and also partially vaccinated to unvaccinated status, 
the ministry said while further adding that the vaccination status can be rectified by the beneficiaries, where in occasional isolated cases, the inoculation certificates are generated due to inadvertent data entry errors by the vaccinator. In updation of data of beneficiary, the changes will take three to seven days after submission of an online request through Raise and Issue Utility. Besides this, India vaccinated more than 58 lakh beneficiaries on Friday till 7 p.m. and with this, the cumulative vaccination coverage crossed 161.05 crore, as per the government data. Tanla Platforms, a global provider of communications as a platform services, has posted a net profit of 158 rupees crore in the third quarter ended December 31, 2021, as against 93 rupees crore in the quarter last year, showing a growth of 69%. It registered a revenue of 885 rupees crore, showing an increase of 35% in the quarter. Tanla has delivered year-on-year -year growth for 22 quarters in a row with a very strong performance in the quarter across all metrics, and we are confident this momentum will continue, Uday Reddy, founder chairman and chief executive officer of Tanla Platforms, has said. During the nine-month period ended December 31, 2021, the firm registered a net profit of 398 rupees crore, showing a growth of 57%. It posted a revenue of 2,353 rupees crore, showing a growth of 39%. During the third quarter, the company entered into an agreement with Vodafone Idea Limited for deployment of blockchain-enabled Wisely platform to secure and encrypt its entire international messaging traffic, he said in a statement on Friday. Geo Platforms has reported a 8.9% growth in net profit at 3,795 Indian rupees crore in the third quarter compared to 3,486 Indian rupees crore in the same period last year. Gross revenue was 13.8% higher at 24,176 Indian rupees crore. Total customer base was up by 10.2 million at 421 million. Average revenue per user during the quarter was up by 8.4% at 151.6 Indian rupees per subscriber per month. Geo undertook 20% hike across prepaid plans effective December 1. The full impact of the tariff hike will be reflected in ARPU and financials over the next few quarters. Total data traffic was 23.4 billion gigabytes during the quarter, which 47.8% higher growth compared to last year. The company said that 5G coverage planning has been completed for 1,000 top cities across the country. Geo has been doing trials on advanced use cases across healthcare and industrial automation on its 5G network. Hotels and hospitality majors are keeping their fingers crossed as they prepare for the sharp V-shaped recovery towards the latter half of Q4, FI22 once Omicron-led disruptions settle. A plunge in occupancies, to 10 to 30 percent, has however, not deterred companies from going ahead with scheduled expansion plan. Loss due to booking cancellations and slowdowns are anticipated to run into 200 Indian rupees crore, if not more, for the industry, as per various analyst estimate. A top official at one of India's major hotel chains said Omicron-driven dip in consumer sentiments saw businesses come down to 50 to 60 percent levels over what it witnessed during the October-December quarter. According to Jagdeep Thakral, general manager, the Grand New Delhi, there were some cancellations and slowdown and the hotel was offering alternate booking dates to get. However, rising apprehensions have certainly clouded fresh bookings and demand is comparatively slower, he told Business Line. With consumer sentiments falling, average daily rates, average rental revenue earned for an occupied room per day, across hotels, too, are down nearly 50% of what they were commanding a month back. Thonika Malhotra Kandari, Joint Managing Director, MBD Group, which owns and manages the Radisson Blue MBD Hotel Noida, the Radisson Blue MBD Hotel Lithiana, among others, ADRs have dropped to 60% of pre-COVID levels, while it was around 70-80% to 80 in the November-December months when recoveries were at the highest. Aspire Group, which owns and operates luxury resort Six Senses Fort Barwara in Rajasthan's Ranthambore, where actors Vicky Kaushal and Katrina Kaif got married, has seen occupancies come down 10-odd percent, from a peak of 70 percent till around a month back.
but expansion plans have not been held back or delayed, says Akil Arora, Chief Operating Officer, Aspire Group, Hospitality Division. The group will look to add 12 odd other locations in 2022, including places like Goa, Masuri, Varanasi, and Vrindavan. The most recent introduction to the portfolio was country in Tarika Riverside Resort, Jim Corbett, brand's second resort in the location. Expansion plans or CAPEX cycles are on track. If Omicron induced restrictions prolong, there could be pressure on Jan, Mar quarter. But we anticipate demand to peak April onwards, and we should be ready for that phase, he said. Leisure Hotels, which operates in prime tourist destinations in North India that includes places like Nanital, Corbett National Park, Ramgar, Kasani, Nakukiatal, Rishikesh, Haridvar, Dharamshala Kasali, apart from Goa, saw occupancies dip to 20% post Omicron, but that has not stopped expansion plan. The company is exploring a foray in Rajasthan while renovation work is going on at Nanital. We have plans to bring on stream six properties by next fiscal, said Vibhas Prasad, director, Leisure Hotels Group. K Hospitality, which owns several QSR brands and restaurant brands like Copper Chimney, Bombay Brasserie, Irish House and Serafini, has lined up close to 50 signings this year while it plans to double presence over the next five years. Other brands like MDB Group and Saravar, too, said there were no delays on expansion plans and construction work across properties remain on track. Saravar has 14 launches lined up in 2022 which include places like Bengaluru, Puducherry, Sonpat, Jamnagar, Orai, Dvarka and in the neighboring country of Nepal. In the October-December period, most hotel major had announced major signings, launched new brands, and made operational new properties as the segment witnessed a sharp uptick. Current booking trends suggest an increase in queries for Hill Station. Travel inquiries related to the hills and other locations have gone up by 40 percent. Due to safety concerns, we are also expecting a rise in demand for unique, unexplored destinations, short weekend getaways and road trips to nearby tourist destinations, Rickant Pittai, co-founder, Ease My Trip said. T Finance Holdings reported a 12.2% jump in consolidated net profit for the quarter ended December 31, 2021, to 325.99 Indian rupees crore. The non-banking finance company had a net profit of 290.66 Indian rupees crore in the third quarter of last fiscal. Its total revenue from operations, however, fell by 12.2% to 2,970.75 Indian rupees crore in the October to December 2021 quarter, against 3,385.17 Indian rupees crore in the corresponding quarter last fiscal. The total lending book also reported a degrowth of 15% to 85,552 Indian rupees crore in the third quarter of the fiscal against Indian rupee 100099 crore a year ago. The company witnessed strong improvement in disbursements and collections in the third quarter of 2021-22, it said in a statement on Friday. Its retail portfolio mix now stands at 50%, in line with its stated strategic objective. At the end of the third quarter, gross stage 3 assets in absolute terms stood at 4,866 Indian rupees crore, almost stable on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis. In percentage terms, the gross stage 3 and net stage 3 assets were at 5.91% and 3.03%, respectively, with provision coverage ratio on stage 3 assets at 50%. It also continues to carry additional provisions of 1,699 Indian rupees crore, corresponding to 2.19% of standard asset. Dinanath Dabhashi, Managing Director and CEO, LT Finance Holdings, said, in our retail businesses of farm and two-wheeler finance, we maintain business momentum as a leading retail financier, with a stable market share owing to our digital and data analytics capability. Our micro-loans business volumes have normalized over 1,000 Indian rupees crore per month month, and we continue to gain traction in consumer loans and home loans. It may sound cliché to say that the union budget to be announced will be more important this year, because this is so every time it is presented. 
FY23 will be different because it will be the start of a new era for the economy where even a possible fourth wave will have less of a negative impact in the form of lockdowns as the earlier one. The country is better prepared to face these waves as a large part of the population is vaccinated and the governments know how not to debilitate economic activity. The budget is actually an income and expenditure statement of the government but has evolved to become a comprehensive policy document where every constituency has something to demand. Therefore the pressures on the finance minister are several and balancing these demands with the inherent constraints of any income expenditure statement is the challenge. The government has acted responsibly even during the pandemic and while the fiscal deficit ratio did overshoot in FI21 by 6% to reach 9.5% of GDP, it was caused by a combination of sharp fall in revenue receipts and higher outlay on necessary relief expenses. There were otherwise few freebies given through tax cuts to the public. The new FRBM norms talk of the glide path to 4.5% fiscal deficit ratio by FY26. This means that beginning from 6.8% targeted for FY22, there has to be a reduction gradually by at least 0.5% of GDP every year so that this target can be achieved. Therefore this would be the starting point of the exercise and even if pegged to 6% would mean a deficit of Indian rupee 15.75 lakh crore, which will be slightly higher than that budgeted for FY22 at Indian rupee 15.06 lakh crore. This indicates the intensity of the borrowing program of the government which will remain high for sure. This is the first number to look out for which will also set the boundary within which the government has to operate. The assumption of GDP growth is important because this becomes the basis for conjectures on tax revenue. GDP growth of 13% looks likely to be assumed which takes in both real GDP growth as well as inflation. The crux will be on consumption increasing in tandem as GST has a share of 28 to 30% in total tax revenue. The wild card will once again be disinvestment on the revenue side. In FY22, Indian rupee 1.75 lakh crore was targeted and it is still not sure if the big ticket of LIC goes through. This is where it will be a puzzle. If LIC goes through this year, then this amount will not be available for FY23 as there are no other big tickets that can garner such an amount. The two public sector banks, which the government spoke of will not materialize this year, which means that it can be pushed to FY23. Therefore, successful LIC disinvestment will mean a lower amount for FY23, which has to be in the region of 75,000 to 8,000 Indian rupees crore assuming the two PSBs and BPCL materialize. With this amount coming down the scope for expenditure will also reduce correspondingly by 1 Indian rupee lakh crore. Expenditure targets and programs have to hence be planned once the fiscal deficit number is fixed, which will be based on a GDP growth number and the disinvestment target. On the expenditure side, too, there are issues. If one looks at the total expenditure of 34.8 Indian rupees lakh crore in FY22, the big tickets included were interest payments, defense, subsidy, and pension. These four heads account for 48% of the total budget and are in a way permanent expenses. There is further a committed expense of Indian rupee 2.6 lakh crore for salaries which get allocated across various ministries and Indian rupee 2.9 lakh crore of transfers to states to carry out certain centrally sponsored schemes. Therefore, around 64% of the budget cannot really be cut in a significant manner. With 35% of funds available now for allocation, it is a case of balancing out priorities and this is where the government has to take a realistic call. Rural and health are two inescapable expenses and there were around 7-8% to of the budget last year. Given that the health priority will continue to dominate during this year with the talks of a booster vaccine being administered to all the people, higher allocations would be required for this purpose. Ever since the government launched the PM Kisan scheme which provides cash transfer to a large section of farmers with a ticket size of 65,000 Indian rupees crore, intuitively cannot be reversed or terminated. Therefore another 1.8% gets caught up in the committed sphere. The call to be taken will be on relief expenditure and whether the free food plan would be extended into FY23. 
therefore practically speaking there would be severe constraints in terms of increasing expenditure in any specific area. The usual argument put forward by economists is to increase capex as this has multiplier effects on the economy in terms of creating jobs and income and hence consumption with a lag. Here, too, the pattern, so far, is quite interesting. In FY22, the government has targeted Indian rupee 5.54 lakh crore of capex. Within this segment, defense has a claim of Indian rupee 1.35 lakh crore, which is almost 24% of total. Another 44% goes to roads and railways and urban development. Around 14% goes as capital assistance to lending institutions and transfer for the national infrastructure pipeline. Given this structure of capex, at a practical level an increase of not more than 10% can really be expected. All this means that we must be moderate in our expectation. Sector-specific demands are unlikely to be part of the budget. The vulnerable sectors could be included under the ECLGS of the government and SMEs, and startups would continue to be focus points in terms of clearances, payments and credit. There could be some minor benefits to individuals on the tax front as there is little room for any kind of largesse. This will be more of a consolidation budget which, ultimately, makes the task easier. The writer is Chief Economist, Bank of Baroda. Views are personal. Bilal Oswal Mutual Fund recently announced temporarily stopping of lump sum and switch in investments into its Modilal Oswal SP500 Index, Modilal Oswal MSCI EAFE Top 100 Select Index, and Modilal Oswal NASDAQ 100 Fund of Fund. Investors are hereby informed that, on account of limitation of fund housewise overseas investment exposure in terms of SEBI, Modilal Oswal Mutual Fund has decided to temporarily suspend creation of ETF units directly with the mutual fund, except otherwise applied by authorized participants, under the scheme. With effect from January 17, it said in a notice. Besides, the AMC has also suspended investments in Motilal Oswal NASDAQ 100 ETF and Motilal Oswal Q50 ETF from January 18. Asset management companies were allowed to channel investor money into overseas instruments in the 2007-2008 budget. It was then decided that the aggregate ceiling for overseas investments would be $5 billion. Within the overall limit, mutual funds were allowed to a maximum of $300 million per mutual fund. The overall ceiling for investment in overseas ETFs was fixed as $1 billion subject to a maximum of $50 million per mutual fund. In November 2020, these limits were increased a bit. MFs were allowed a maximum of $600 million per scheme, and the overall industry limit was raised to $7 billion. But, the ceiling on the overseas exchange-traded fund was restricted to $200 million per MF, within the overall industry limit of $1 billion. Again in June 2021, SEBI restored the limit to $300 million per MF in overseas exchange-traded fund while retaining the overall industry limit of $1 billion. Though the current limit of $7 billion is yet to be fully utilized, some schemes are fast approaching the cap meant for the individual fund or $30 million. The time has come to increase the limit, given the investor interest in overseas market. To capitalize on this, Domestic fund houses are also keen to launch mutual funds invested in overseas assets. However, it would be better to give the freedom to fund managers themselves on the size of individual fund. They are better positioned to judge and control the inflows within the overall industry limit, which can be doubled to $14 billion. It may be recalled that Edelweiss Fund House said that it would limit investments to a maximum of 1 Indian rupee lakh per day per investor from February 1. A few years back, DSP Mutual Fund, too, restricted its inflow into small cap fund, citing valuation concern. Overseas funds may similarly regulate flows based on valuations and market conditions assessment. IDBI Bank expects gross non-performing assets to decline below 17% of gross advances by March end 2022 and below 12% by March end 2023. GNPAs declined to 20.56% as at December end 2021, against 21.85% as at September end 2021. Rakesh Sharma, MD CEO, IDBI Bank, 
said that once the transfer of stressed assets, aggregating about 11,000 Indian rupees crore to the National Asset Reconstruction Company LTD happens, it will help bring down GNPAs by about 4 percentage point. This transfer of stressed assets is expected to materialize by March end. Referring to earlier recovery projection of 4,000 Indian rupees crore, Sharma emphasized that the bank has already made recoveries amounting to 4,334 Indian rupees crore. And we are quite hopeful that we will be able to show recoveries of 5,000 Indian rupees crore for the full year, he said. The bank is eyeing a loan growth 8 to 10% year on year in FY22 and more than 10% in FY23. The IDBI bank chief observed that during the last four years, when the bank was under the Reserve Bank of India's prompt corrective action, and even after that, there was degrowth in corporate advances. But during the third quarter, the bank has shown 13% yoy growth in mid-corporate advances. This has been our focus area also. We will be taking smaller exposure to good company. Going forward, our policy is to grow quality advances to show reasonable, sustainable and calibrated growth so that we don't face slippages and stress. Looking at the COVID situation, we have to be quiet, calibrated in our approach. We have to take calculated risks, said Sharma. Samuel Joseph, Deputy Managing Director, IDBI Bank, explained that most of the growth that has come in the mid-corporate advances segment is from the existing good client. These are the clients to whom the bank earlier was not able to enhance its prorata exposure in consortiums or multiple banking arrangement. In such cases, the bank has been able to take some incremental share. Referring to the good corporate relationships IDBI Bank had lost during the PCA period as it was not able to give them the support they wanted, Joseph said, we have, sort of, brought them back. He underscored that these are clients with established track record with the bank. We have also onboarded a few new relationships which are well-rated and well-regarded. P. Sitaram, EDCFO, noted that the bank continues with its strategy of maximizing growth in retail. We will also be growing the corporate book. Therefore, the current retail, corporate loan mix of 63, 37 will shift to 55 45 over the medium term, he said. India is likely to make a shift from palm oil to soy oil and sunflower oil as Indonesia is planning to limit palm oil export. India could import more palm oil from Malaysia, while also importing more soft oil. But this can only be a short term measure. The government has a plan to reduce the country's import dependent. The National Mission on Edible Oils, Oil Palm, for which the government has earmarked 11,040 Indian rupees crore.